I'm delighted to welcome you today to our two pan panelists. Lee Pickett um, is joint head of DWF's National Public Sector Real Estate Group. He acts on large developments and regeneration projects with particular emphasis on housing regeneration. He acts for numerous national delivery agencies and local authorities. And just a few of his recent projects include acting for Homes England in relation to the accelerated delivery program, Royal Borough of Greenwich on various regeneration programs, including a new leisure centre and residential scheme in Woolwich Town Centre, and the Welsh Government on the Global Centre for Rail Excellence and Cardiff Transport Interchange. Lee is recognised by Legal 500 as a next generation partner, as well as Chambers uh, for his public sector led development and regeneration work. Welcome, Lee, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Rita Minister. Ba Rita Bange is an established and well known local government regeneration and governance specialist, having worked in house in local government at Staffordshire County Council, Westminster. Westminster City Council and London Borough of Tower Hamlets, Rita has a unique insight and, and understanding of local government issues and is able to provide solutions orientated advice. She has a very solid delivery track record. She was National Lead for Housing and Regeneration for Lawyers in Local Government or LLG and was shortlisted for In-House Solicitor of the Year at the Law Society Awards in 2021. Welcome, Rita, and thanks for joining thank us. Thank, thank you. you. Um, on behalf of everyone attending today, thank you to you both and over to you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, how are you today, Rita? Are you OK? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good, thanks, Lee. Um, we, um, just for our audience, we had a bit of a catch up yesterday just discussing these topics, and um, I think we hopefully will be a really good session. Absolutely. And, and as Melissa said, it took us a lot longer than an hour to cover uh, all the things we wanted to cover, didn't it? So we're going to have to try and uh, keep it uh, relatively punchy today. But yes, please do put your questions in the chat and we'll try and come to them at um, convenient junctures. So um, the first thing we've been asked to have a, uh, a chat about is, is what are the, where are the regeneration opportunities arising from councils changing use of their own property? Um, so, I mean, you and I know that there's you know, a number of sort of popular models for unlocking land, um, land deals, you know, usually with a non-development buyback option, the, uh, developer procurement and development agreement structure, there's direct delivery and commission, and there's the use of either contractual or corporate JVs or local authority delivery vehicles. Um, I think you had a, a, a bit you wanted to say about yeah, in particular so the, the repurpose regeneration, didn't absolutely. you? Absolutely. So um, I've, I've recently written a piece which will be out in the ether at some point, I'm sure in, in the coming weeks regarding repurpose regeneration and the opportunity that it presents for local authorities. So um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of lawyers will be aware and, and see cabinet reports which detail three options in relation to a proposed redevelopment and those three options generally tend to be the do nothing approach, um, repurposing um, or, or refurbing um, a, a building or what I would say is a knockdown and rebuild regeneration. Um, I think it's fair to say that option two, which is that repurpose regeneration isn't probably considered and investigated with the same vigour as as option three. Um, and I think that in the coming years ahead, that option two is really going to need to be investigated in, in more detail, really, um, particularly with the climate agenda and thinking about net zero targets, etc. So with a lot of local authorities owning quite large um, proportions of town centres and high streets, um, I have prepared a few bullet points in relation to what are the things that a, a local authority would really need to think about in terms of repurposing a building. And as I was preparing that piece, that as, as I've said, is going to be coming out in the coming weeks, what I found quite interesting about it is actually it's it's as complicated as a, a full knockdown rebuild um, regeneration. Um, I had a, 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 a conversation with a tax colleague this morning. Um, I'm not a tax expert in any way, shape or form. Um, and one of the things that we talked about this morning was 
about the fact that um, new that, that sort of grant funding for refurbing buildings is particularly limited um, and that local authorities, yes, there, there is a uh, option, there's an ability to claim back tax, but um, a lot of uh, finance and treasury colleagues will be aware of the 5% de minimis rule and how it's possible that you may need to stagger and phase um, refurbing a building or that type of regeneration to, in essence, ensure that you're getting um, sufficient uh, tax benefits from it, because I, my understanding is it's a, it's an all or nothing approach with, with the 5% de minimis rule. But as I say, I'm not a tax expert. Um, so uh, from, from my perspective, I, I think that um, LERB, as, as, as I called it yesterday, and I'm going to continue to call it today, Lee, which is the Leveling <laughs> Regeneration Bill, um, I think it presents local authorities with a good opportunities to, to refurb and, and use assets and, and in, in a new and different way. Um, I don't think that local authorities have, ne have ever been shy about that. Um, I, I always bang the drum of, about funding and ultimately these things cost money. And at the moment, as I've said, I, I don't believe that there is the same level of um, financial incentive um, out there in terms of central government funding to facilitate this this reuse of, of buildings in, in a different way. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with all of that. Um, and, you know, overarching all of that, you mentioned repurpose is, is obviously economic regeneration, jobs and, and social value. Um, and when it comes to the tax, we, we, we touched upon how we often tell, suggest to people that they don't let the tax tail wag the, the regeneration right. dog because uh, it, you know it, whilst it's a very important to get that that advice uh, you have to weigh that up against what the the uh, local authorities primary objectives are in the in the regeneration um i think the other point that we touched upon was the well the elephant in the room if you like is the forthcoming cuts is not further and deeper cuts um so councils might have to be asked or be thinking about selling or otherwise economically exploiting the regeneration sites to enable the continued delivery of public services. I mean, there's been a lot of talk, hasn't there, about you know, things like closure of swimming pools uh, because uh, energy costs are rising and the, the you know, perfect storm of that plus uh, cuts makes, you know, means that something's got to give, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I, one of the points I, I sort of, again, talked about yesterday in our, our, our pre-chat, which apologies everybody if I constantly mention our previous discussion um is that I read somewhere um which um I I, I believe it was a local government association actually um but I'd, I'd have to check that that between 2010 and 2020 council saw a real terms reduction of core funding of 15 billion which equates to almost 60p in every pound so I think that when we are talking about um funding cuts um I always talk about how the local authority brief has never, it doesn't change. In fact, I think it just gets wider. Um, I know that we're going to be talking about green issues a bit later. So the brief for local authorities, it just expands and expands and expands, but it's funding um, uh, streams and, and, and in, in terms of from central government just appears to be shrinking. So I I, 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 I kind of say that inflation, it, it, it affects everybody. So it affects local authorities as well. And local authorities, yes, they have reserves, but the nature of a reserve is you can only spend it once. Once it's gone, it's gone. And in terms of local services, once once something's been cut, you can only cut it once. So I, I, I kind of really sometimes struggle to, to, to think how are local authorities going to get everything done when there seems to be such a squeeze? Yeah, so I think we're, we're moving now from the... Um short-lived positivity about opportunities into the barriers aren't we and the, and, and and we've we've very much covered a, a couple of them there um in terms of other barriers um i was i was going to say powers but obviously powers are are, 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 are to enable rather than block but the, i think the the point is isn't it, that as, as always um our, our clients need to ensure that they've got the powers to do what they want to do and they're, they're uh, abiding by by public law and, and delivering their objectives. Um, I was, I remember discussing saying to you that um, for a long while in my career I wasn't really ever asked to advise that much in detail on appropriation between the housing revenue account and the general fund in either direction because 
those in local authorities seem to know it best. Um, but there's starting to become a trend now of, of that being outsourced to the likes of our firms. And perhaps that flows into the next point, which is that there seems to be a bit of a, a pressure on council uh, capacity and capability, probably as a result of the of, of years of cuts. Um, they're obviously planning is both an enabler and a potential blocker, but we're going to come to that later. I think you're going to talk quite a bit about that, aren't you? Um, subsidy control, as also uh, as always, which will link into some of the funding pots that uh, you discussed, and public procurement, which again we'll, we're going to come on to later. Um, yeah, fund funding is a bit of a pet that sort of subject of yours, Rita. So did you want did you want to come in a bit yeah. about that? Um, so um, I, I find funding sort of quite quite interesting um, in so far as um, one of the first things I always ask a client when when starting a scheme or or anything along the lines is is it's okay. So where's the money coming from? <laughs> um, and it's okay to not have the funding in place at that particular time um, because as projects develop, things change. But one of the sort of, um, I would say, uh, I, I think sort of what LERB doesn't address is this element of there are, in a sense, too many pots. So there is uh, levelling up funding, Towns Fund funding, Homes England funding, um, combined authority funding, etc. And all of this is great, but each funding pot has its own restrictions of of drawdown when it has to be spent, when it has to be used, and it will have its own sort of measures in terms of uh, what what's uh, particularly grant funding, like for example, like um, outcomes and outputs, etc. And I think that there's a real piece here that central government could really grab by the teeth and. What I would say is review projects and opportunities on a case-by-case -case basis um, and, and actually look at the scheme as a whole and say, well, actually, what we, we will do is we will give you this part and, and you can do this to enable this, to facilitate this. Um, because my it, it, it just feels like it's sometimes it's a bit of a patchwork quilt whereby you're... Uh, uh, we talk about the tail wagging the dog and I'd be interested to sort of see if anybody agrees with me in the comment in the comments on this on this in this forum as to a lot of the time there's always that mad pressure of we need to have a spade in the ground by x we need to spend x by we need to spend this money by x and that really just adds further pressure to this regeneration piece and this delivery piece so i'm i'm just wondering if if there is actually a, a space uh, or an opportunity to just look at funding in a in a new way and in a new lens through a new lens um i'm not really too sure that lerb um, addresses that to be perfectly honest with you um lerb its intentions quite clearly are to bring forward um uh, housing uh, create uh, community spaces amenities uh, and infrastructure etc but and that's what i would say is that overarching principle which is absolutely great but i'm i'm a, a delivery girl i'm an implementation girl i'm like okay so how do we how do we make that happen um and and i'm not sure that this actually solves that problem yeah I think that's right. And then linked into that is, I think, a, a point around finance and market demand. You know, normally in a recession, land is purchased by authorities with a view to regenerating later because there is there are opportunities from um, a, a dip in land values. Um, but if the if the funding isn't around or any funding that would otherwise be surplus and able to be used strategically is taken up by cuts or further cuts, then those opportunities aren't there to um, kind of strategically purchase without using uh, planning powers. Absolutely. Um, so I think one of the the other sort of um, questions that that included within our, our brief is um, what opportunities can be presented by the leveling up and regeneration bill. Um, and I don't want to don't want to come across as the bad guy. Um, and quite clearly, there's a lot of positivity there as well. So one of the um, points that I've particularly picked up on is um, the power of local authorities to bring um, vacant properties back into use, which I think is an encouraging step. I think that's really, really great. But I just wanted to sort of dissect that in, in two sort of ways, whereby we have our local authority uh, landowner who I'd like to think that I can speak for 
for local authorities when I say I don't believe that local authorities are intentionally leaving their properties vacant. I don't, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, in the case of sort of, um, and I appreciate that that's aimed at, at, other, at, at other landlords, but I think what this is another example of proof being in the pudding. So um, these um, auctions need to be cost effective. They need to be very simple, but also they need to be, um, it's really important that they don't jeopardize future relationships with um, these the, the landlords and these, these landowners. Um, and we offset that short term view against that long term view, because it's quite possible that, that these are areas that could be uh, ripe for, for regeneration in the future. And the last thing that we want to do is to um, create difficult relationships with these landlords. So I think that local authorities, I think this is a good opportunity. If, as I say, proof is in the pudding. What, what does this process look like? Um, funding again, um, these processes cost money. How, how do you do it? And also, again, just not jeopardizing that relationship with these these landowners and these these landlords because actually there are potentially long term regeneration ambitions and potentially development partners there. So it's it's that fine line. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, we we had a little bit of a debate yesterday about the high street rental auction idea in particular, didn't we? Um, and whether that's really been thought through in the detail, you know, what if a property is in a negative equity as well as your point about relationships with um, you know private sector partners and landowners in the in the in the, in the areas. Um, and I guess the, the the broader points are, um, you know, there's been change at the top again. Um, so what does that mean for the direction of the bill? Um, there are there are roughly a dozen core missions in there and uh, various agencies responsible for their delivery. That probably seems quite ambitious and there will be a question about how strictly they're held to deliver upon it. Um, I think we discussed devolution being an important um, change as ever. Metro mayors are popular and probably deserve to be back with meaningful investment via devolution deals. Um, there's there are county deals uh, being suggested, which also seems sensible for, for the areas that don't have a or don't want a mayor. Um, but there's no real detail on that at the moment. Um, yeah, we've we've also seen that it's in draft form. It's attracting a lot of proposed amendments. Uh, and what 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 were your th I mean, we we talked yesterday about the rough sleeping one. Didn't we? What, what were your thoughts about that one? Again, I, it feels a bit un, it's sort of un. un uncomfortable isn't it really to in essence sort of criminalize rough sleeping right um i'm I, it, it, it's the impact it's the impact on the authorities it, isn't it because absolutely so again it's this this conversation of the brief expanding but the funding reducing um so again these are problems that local authorities have always faced and uh, again i i can't see that that sort of tangible that this is that tangible solution. Um, one of the things that I'm sort of quite particularly interested in is um, I, I've sort of talked about the, the, the what I would say the purpose of LERB is it is to deliver those high quality homes and as I've said create communities and infrastructure and, and all of this sort of wonderful stuff which I totally agree with but it feels to me that it it doesn't really understand the issue with regards to right to buy. Um, I know I've said it. Oh my god! Um, that <laughs> I, I I I've I've worked in house. I've I've I I I know that the challenges of what many local government lawyers face in um, and the internal processes and everything that the challenges there. But what I'm really sort of sort of struggling with here is if, if my understanding is correct and I appreciate that there have been changes with regards to right to buy receipts um so extending um the, the council's ability to spend right to buy receipts from three years to five years um the the percentage cap of applying right to buy receipts is from 30 to 40 percent and that that stuff's great but if my understanding is correct as it stands local authorities don't keep 100 percent of their right to buy receipts so we are and, and speaking plainly, stock is being sold faster than it's being built. Um, you can trigger a right to buy after three years. 
and a lot of these developments take longer than three years to come on stream. So we are in a situation, as I've said, stock is being sold faster than it's being built. And actually 100% of a local authority's right to buy receipt is not necessarily able to be applied in, in, in certain ways to enable um, local authorities to acquire, um, to, to facilitate regeneration. So that puts the sort of the, the push on local authorities in terms of delivery partners and, and borrowing, et cetera. So I, I think that what's really important is there needs to be uh, what I would say a, a very round view in relation to a housing strategy approach and, and how we solve the crisis. Um, I know that we talked very briefly yesterday about uh, Wales abolishing right to buy. Um, I, I don't think that that's necessarily the answer, but I, I, I do think that there needs to be a real understanding of right to buy and how quickly local authorities are in essence losing their stock um, and, and and how do we solve that problem because we're, we're just always playing catch up and we're not even playing catch up with a full pound anymore so I, I think that that's just something that just needs to be thought about in a bit more detail. Yeah um, I might just pause there for a second Rita because um, uh, a gentleman called Chris has put a, a, a comment there on the on the Q&A um, so uh, local authorities are faced with increasing interest rates, um, planning requirements, rapid build cost inflation for projects, just as the commercial developers are, with extreme pressures on stat services budgets, many LAs facing borrowing limits driven by interest, bill hitting the revenue budgets, um, joint venture will be the most likely route with partners bringing the finance, which should take a period of time for the politician to appreciate reality. Um, here. Is that a like, Chris? Because I totally agree. So I'm just going to give you a thumb up there. Yeah, and we've, you know, we 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 did. We, I think we'll probably come to later and did discuss yesterday those opportunities to lever in um, private money um, for, you, for via various different uh, models, and there's many authorities already doing that and doing that in a very smart way. Um, and that's that's the ability, one of the ways in which it's an opportunity to exploit um, their estate, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, do you think we do you think we we move on at this point to, about the sustainability, Rita? Just keeping an eye yeah. on time. Yeah, let's uh, let's see what we can uh, cobble together. <laughs> so, sustainability, environmental, carbon neutral issues, um, and that's that renew or refurbish um, question uh, as well. Uh, I mean the. Just as we were talking, almost as we were talking yesterday, uh, point about how things are fast moving at the moment is that we were just 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 about discussing how uh, Rishi Sunak was not going to go to COP27, and then the BBC News articles announced that well, actually, he is he is turned around and he is going. So, but at the point where when he was refusing to go or saying they had other priorities, um, what might that have indicated? You know, we were uh, discussing what would that might have indicated to climate change. It, does that mean it's no longer a central government policy? Um, and if you've got areas where uh, the authorities, in particular, you know, as, uh, I think you cited the stat of 300 out of so many had declared a climate emergency. Um, if they've gone in all all in on the green industry revolution, that kind of you know leaves them in a difficult position if central government are, are retracting from that position, doesn't it? Absolutely. And one of the things I we talked about uh, yesterday was that I really do feel that local authorities are really driving change and at the forefront of, of the green agenda. Um, it, it, I just want to refer to my notes quickly here. It, it is 300 uh, local authorities have declared um, a climate emergency, so they acknowledge that there is a need for um, rapid action. Um, which I think is absolutely a really positive step, and I, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Um, but I always come back down to earth um, when I think about, OK, we talk about retrofitting, we talk about even in terms of uh, uh, knockdown and, and rebuild jobs, etc., using um, uh, air source heat pumps, modern methods of construction and all of this sort of stuff. Speaking plainly, but this stuff does cost money. Um, so one of the things I, I, I sort of thought about this yesterday and, and I sort of put together what I would think are four, four bullet points in relation to um, a local authority's approach to, to climate change. Um, and what I 
could see is that local authorities individually, they have their own frameworks, they have their own um, plans and agendas, but there doesn't appear to be what I would say is an overarching support of central government in relation to facilitation and delivery of that. Um, and as you've mentioned, um, that sort of approach by central government in relation to, to not attending COP27 and, and whether it is seen as a priority, um, that, that's sort of quite questionable. So I think that there's an element for for work and support between local authorities and central government as to um, how do local authorities deliver uh, net zero carbon by 2050. Um, I'm going to talk about money again because that's what I'm here to do. <laughs> um, and just talk about um, there needs to be uh, strategic um, uh, long term finance available to support local authorities to deliver net zero. So this not is only, I would say, in relation to development and infrastructure jobs that, that we talk about. So we talk about large scale regeneration, but from an operational level as well, in terms of a local authority uh, carrying out its statutory function. So I, I think that there's a there's a piece of work there. I think that there needs to be consideration for flexibility. So when I talk about flexibility, I'm sort of talking about that a London borough's approach to achieving net zero by 2050 is going to be completely different to a, a rural county, for example, um, because the um, the 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 uh, the issues are different. Um, and so I think that there needs to be what I would say flexibility around how local authorities address their their climate emergency, which they appear to be doing themselves because there isn't that overarching sort of principle um, from, from central government. And then also, I think the one thing that I've got here is, is about facilitation. So we're talking about um, a clear policy, a clear powers and real sort of facilita facilitation and engagement to ensure delivery of these objectives. So. For me at the moment, I'm, I feel like the net zero climate change agenda is something that local authorities are really spearheading and, and they are going out there and delivering. But I do think that there is more space for more support. And also, I, I, I mean, I'm just thinking about this off the cuff now, if, if there's a space for, for private organisations to work with local authorities to, to sort of implement some of this stuff as well. So it's, it's a big piece of work, but I'm really proud of local authorities that they are just really sort of going on and actually delivering. Yeah, and the, you know, we're certainly working with a number of authorities who are uh, looking at large scale retrofitting uh, projects um, to deal with not only the um, health and safety issues arising, arising from um, uh, new legislation on the back of the Grenfell tragedy, but also carbon neutrality. Now, there, there are difficulties with that, aren't there? So, uh, I mean, I think you've you touched upon engagement there, and perhaps that's something we could have mentioned in barriers before when you come to a state regeneration and looking at you know, balloting on. And I know there's at least one London where are struggling at the moment with an, an objection to uh, to a, re a housing regen scheme. Um, so there's consultation issues as ever, or, or, or you could see that as an opportunity to engage and speak to your constituents and your residents, of course, in a positive way. Um, you know, the, the, if you're retrofitting, you've got to consider the rights to enter the premises. Um, that might, in relation to um, health and safety, involve you know something like an installation of sprinklers or misters, um, and that how that might differ between your secure tenants and um, long lease holders who have uh, exercised the right to buy. Yeah. Um, there's then a question of recoverability of the costs. And whether you need what we used to call a section 20 consultation under the LTA 1985, but it's now under the Common Hold uh, Leasehold Reform Act. Um, who's going to be liable? Um, fonts for the works once they're installed, um, and to the uh, and the uh, uh, the implication of the ones with council and tribunal case we touched upon, didn't we? Because um, that basically said you can't just take a Make a blanket approach to all of your stock. You need to do a, a case by case and look at the peculiarities and the details of each each block in turn, and to, to get to get that ruling on uh, recovery uh, through service charge. Um, there's human rights issues because you, you're effectively saying we, for the paternalistic good reasons, we need to come into your property, temporarily interfere with your um, life, and and, and install some some improvements um and then there are there is um 
your favourite subject of use of use of right to privacy. So I think we've probably covered enough earlier, actually, haven't well, we? Let's let's put a pin in that one, shall we? Yeah. We can talk about that for a while. <laughs> What do you and what what about the uh, have you come across one I have which is this tension between best value and how much does it cost to get to net zero? What what do you see in there? Um, well, this is the thing. I I I haven't had to sort of grapple with it too much yet, but I do think there is going to be this tension, uh, sort of as you you've mentioned, whereby um, achieving net zero isn't going to be the most financial potentially potentially on cost value um financially uh rewarding um, it, costs, it costs more to deliver that yeah, those yeah, standards yeah, doesn't absolutely it? It, it, yeah, just, yeah. it just does so um there, there's definitely going to have to be a consideration for for that and 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 how you how you deal with that but then also if it's a part of your your policy um it's a part of your 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 authorities policy etc and um, I'm sure that there's quite a lot of sort of case law out there where you can kind of um, apply. I, I, I just don't, I, I think it's a, it's a bit of a difficult one, really, to be perfectly honest with you, because I think that it might be quite testy now, but I think in two years time it will just be the norm, because actually, yeah. as with everything, uh, there's always a starting point in terms of going, what I'm going to say, going green. Um, yeah. Whereas in terms of best value considerations, uh, valuations, et cetera, in two or three years time, it, it's just going to be a criterion because actually everybody will be doing it. Yeah, and I think, yeah, and the, the, the net, net residual land value appraisal will, can probably justify okay. the additional cost that is being procured. But it it does suppress the land value. So if you're in the game of wanting to maximise capital receipts because of you need money because you need because of the funding cuts, then that's that's a lot of a lot of the, the nub of the of the tension, isn't it? So I find myself saying to, to authorities, well, you're saying you're going to procure this than this, but if if that means that um, they'll say, well, in that case, the land value is low or possibly even negative, then you know, will you stick? Will you stick to your guns for the for the medium and longer term gain of um, of the the benefit of the carbon neutrality? And, and you said before, and in, you know, remember before you said, I'm not a value, and we're not valuers. But on a on a decarbonisation um, discussion we had last year, there was a valuer on who kind of said, well, Matt, perhaps there needs to be a change in the in the way that these properties are valued, so that if you've got a property with a higher EPC rating or, or whatever, then perhaps that should increase therefore the, the gross development value and then you've got there's more value in there as opposed to um as opposed to, to, to money but value that can be can be leveraged later um uh, from the 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 higher energy efficiency. Absolutely. It's it's uh I hate to be that person that tries that's it's kicking the can down the road, but I think I might be kicking the can down the road. <laughs> Shall we move on? <laughs> Um, so next we're going to we're going to have a chat about the scope to use investment properties for regeneration. I think this really links into Chris's point earlier and, and that and that kind of thinking. Um, now, public sector commercial investment has you know long been you know a great idea when it works, and we, certainly we used to go around touring talking about the commercial council a few years ago and speaking to uh, authorities and their partners about it. That said. Perhaps a few authorities have gone a little bit too far with it, and those those are sort of you know high profile. I mentioned I'm not, not mention I'm not mention any names here. To, oh, well to, documented, I think it's fair to say. Well documented, yeah. So those that have borrowed heavily and and gone gone quite quite large on that, which is now presenting them with some difficulties of um, of high debt. Um, now what what we do know is that as currently drafted, um, your beloved Lerb. Um, in uh, draft section 114, the government can direct councils to reduce the borrowing level and sell assets within a set time frame if the borrowing is too great. And and they, again, if they're in that, if you're an authority in that position, in presumably it wouldn't be publicly known that that was effectively some form of fire sale. But it's not it's not great for achieving long term aim, aims or getting the the, the, the highest return uh, for things you're being asked to to um to dispose of is it um yeah so fundamentally it's, it's the sweet sauce marrying up investing alongside achieving regeneration aims now as you know as as chris suggests 
joint ventures and bringing in public uh, private money to to, to complement uh, and and ex exploit the the land ownership and we've, we've we've touched upon as well the use of you know increasing use of kind of income strip and forward funding um schemes for on regeneration projects are, are there to be used and and uh, you know uh, again i can't i couldn't i couldn't agree more that if the money's not going to come from uh, central government and and all the various funding pots. Then, you know, it's the, the, the increasingly they'll have to turn to the private sector to to fill that void. Absolutely, and I think that um, speaking uh, sort of plainly, uh, public works long board money is is not necessarily as attractive as it was a, a couple of years ago. And and my understanding is the rules have changed around it slightly as well. Um, and just a sort of um, I think. Uh, I think that the 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 well documented cases are uh, are an example. I think where local authorities don't necessarily want to get their fingers burnt and and sort of be caught out in in those sorts of situations as well. So I'm I I think that that there is definitely an opportunity and and I think that um, investment properties for regeneration, of, of course they're definitely needed but I think that there would need to be a very sort of a detailed options appraisal and there would just need to be as I sort of say a lessons learned in terms of uh what well, I kind of want to say bad examples and and what not to do um but I do think that maybe there are quite a few authorities that have seen that and and quite often they they just they step away from it completely um rather than thinking to themselves well actually um the well documented cases are are failed or, or bad because of x y and z and what we do is we make sure we don't do that so yeah. I, I think that there's a there's definitely scope there but i think that it's definitely one for a case by case basis and and all authorities will know their their sort of holdings pretty well yeah to make those decisions. But it's, it's 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 about the the portfolio of risk isn't it like anything yeah. you, it needs to be needs to be balanced uh, absolutely in, in, in relation I, to each as i say there's 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 not anything which is without risk what we do is we mitigate risk so um that that's the function isn't it that's what we try yeah. to do i mean i think i think a few weeks ago when when mr mr quasi announced his budget and um the world went a bit mad for a few days um you know there was that situation where well okay if you if you go into recession the public sector steps forward and they usually can invest and take opportunities uh, like the ones we discussed earlier on with the with the prudential borrowing rates going up as well, yeah. you know, I certainly saw a number of projects where the, the the local authority and its partners had to say, well, actually, the pricing doesn't look the same now. The financial model doesn't work anymore. It's no longer viable, um, or you know, not not in this mix. And and a, a lot of projects kind of went on went on hold almost immediately. Now, whether that will now flush out into something that looks better under the you know under the new arrangements of Mr. Sunak's government will. That that's probably remains to remains to be seen. Lots of talk about interest hikes today yeah. again, which was not not unexpected. Absolutely, uh, as I say, proof is in that lovely pudding, isn't it? Sure. Um, shall we move on and talk about um, CPO? Yes. Um, so the you know the the question is, what effect the the proposed changes to the CPO regime might have on uh, regeneration projects? And um, I think you were. And it's going to share your thoughts on that. Uh, Rita. Yes, so um, I've, I've picked up a few highlights um, just to, to discuss. And um, again, I'd welcome comments in the in the Q&A if you agree or disagree. That would be wonderful. Um, so gone is the all or nothing approach to to confirmation of a CPO. So um, at present, if a CPO um, lacks planning permission, for example, or there's an issue with the scheme, they it, it can just be uh, rejected flat out, as it were, um, and not confirmed. So LERB um, allows a CPO to be confirmed conditionally. Um, so it's very likely that these sorts of conditions are going to be, for example, a planning permission or um, until a scheme is um, what I would say challenge free in terms of a planning permission. Um, there's also a piece as well, I think, here in relation to when we talk about a confirmation of a CPO and it being conditional, uh, what 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 are these conditions going to be? So 
is is it stuff such as planning permission or is it stuff um, like uh, what I would say is deliverability and viability? Um, a lot of attendees uh, will be aware of the Barking and Dagenham decision um, in relation to the fact that that matter, the, the CPO was not confirmed. And I've got a few notes here because in that particular case, the inspector did actually comment and say that there was national policy support, regional policy drive and, and a strong local policy. And even by his own words said that there was an extremely compelling case for the CPO to be confirmed. However, in that case, it wasn't. And in that case, it was because there were concerns in relation to the funding um, aspects of it and, fund, uh, and, and viability of the scheme. So what I am quite interested in is, are we going to have um, con CPOs which are conditional on such things as uh, funding um, viability um, and, and deliverability? Um, because those aspects of a, of a, of a scheme feel quite quite large in aspects to other considerations for a scheme. So, for example, a planning permission going un unconditional, because quite often when, when you're going through the CPO process, you you're already have your planning in tray, etc. Um, you might not have a decision, but, but you're definitely in tray. So what I'm quite interested to see is that, is to see what a Barking and Dagenham decision would look like in, in a LERB world. Um, and the outcome that we would get for a Barking and Dagenham type of scheme um, in, in a LERB world. LERB world. <laughs> um, abuse, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I, 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 it, it feels it feels to me that it's trying to be helpful. Um, but as I've kind of always talking about this famous pudding, I think proof is in it. And actually, as I've said, it's about that conditionality as to what conditionality looks like. One of the other sort of points, well, two other points I wanted to really just touch on were, was for new powers. So the bill is going to give local authorities um, uh, compulsory purchase powers, which are similar to Homes England and the GLA, OK, which I think is a good thing. But from from practice myself and from speaking to a, a, a few friends in the industry, when we, we look at CPO and, and we talk about regeneration and using a CPO, we're never really thinking to ourselves, and we haven't got the power. Um, so I've, I've just listed out here that there's Housing Act powers, there's Town and Country Planning Act powers, there's Planning and Listed Building and Conservation Areas Act, Education Act, Highways Act. So it's never really the fact that actually there's an issue in terms of our power to CPO. I think that the issue is in relation to process and making the process easier to navigate. Um, quite often, um, matters are pushed to a costly inquiry and there is no obligation to use the written reps process. So I'd, I'd like I'd like for there to be a piece around that. So uh, additional powers, that's fine. It, it doesn't hurt to have them. I, I do think that we've probably got enough. But again, I'm, I stand corrected if, if somebody disagrees with me. The issue with CPO isn't the powers. The issue with CPOs, I think, is about the process and and and, and how that works. Uh, and, and just sort of finally touching on another point, apologies, Lee, bit of a geek here, um, <laughs> is, 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 is implementation. So um, quite a lot of you uh, will be acting for local authorities and you're coming, you've got your CPO confirmed and, and you've um, your, 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 your vesting parcels of land or noticing to treat, noticing to enter. That's absolutely great. And then two and a half years in, you, 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 your client is sort of a mad panic just to make sure that they've acquired um, all of the land um, before, in essence, what I would say is the CPO expires. So my understanding is that there's going to be, there's a proposal whereby there's going to be an option to extend um, this ability for, for local, local authorities as to when they need to acquire land and, and when they vest, etc. Um, which is great from a, a local authority's perspective, because again, we don't have that mad dash at two and a half years in. But it's it's a good it's a good cure for that problem, I should say. But the only thing that I would say is that I think that that kind of comes with some what I would say are side effects. And so a longer implementation period is only really a good thing, I think, for a local authority or its development partner. Um, what it means for affected parties is that they're living with the shadow of a CPO or an implement or, or implementation of a CPO for longer. Um, and so I think that there needs to be a consideration 
um, when, when these powers are implemented um, to ensure that there's clear communication and dialogue with these affected parties by local authorities that we don't, what I would say is unnecessarily extend these, these deadlines uh, for implementation of a CPO um, because it just, it just feels to me that it could be potentially a little bit unfair for our um, affected parties. Yeah, um, and uh, th thanks again to, to Chris for engaging on the uh, on the Q and A there. And there's a, a point that I was going to ask about the this idea of a, a you know CPO conditional confirmation. Um, so you know Chris is saying that he's, he's he's sat through one recently for a major town centre region project, and that that would be a very helpful thing to have a conditional confirmation. Um, you know, when after several years of uh, site assembly planning, you know, the, otherwise the cost is, is written off just because the viability appraisal and they they zero didn't ignore the economic cycles and the sheer length of time that it takes to, to deliver in what it looks like five years later or how many years to, years think, later. So. Think, yeah, and I think that actually the Barking and Dagnum example is a really good example of that. I mean, I think that there are issues there, to be perfectly honest with you, because of viability and and. I think the facts in that case, the uh, viability was submitted as part of the planning, um, and there there was no there were not there was no evidence in relation to viability that was provided in relation to the scheme prior to an inquiry, etc. And also there were other issues as well about engagement with affected parties that was quite limited. One of the things that's always been drilled into me is that CPO is a tool of last resort, so. Uh, if it's a last resort, then I'd like to think that you really try to to acquire that yeah. land voluntarily. So I th I th as I said, I think the concept, I think it is a good thing. I, I do. Uh, but as I say, a lot of this stuff is devil in the detail territory. And what will be quite interesting, I think, is that inspectors approaches to it. So if we have one inspector that, for example, makes a decision which is conditional to, for example, fi financial viability, and then another inspector who actually says, well, actually, no, that's that seems like a really big hurdle to clear on, on in this particular case. Um, so I, I think consistency across the board is going to be quite interesting. Yeah. Now, just conscious of time, um, did you have anything briefly to say on any other changes to planning laws, um, you know, such as conversions uh, or anything like that? Or shall we shall we move on briefly to procurement? I'm I'm not a planning lawyer, but the only thing that I I Likewise. Have, have, have touched on is this um, infrastructure levy, um, which, if my understanding is correct, um, it enables uh, payments of an infra uh, of a, a new levy um, to local authorities. Um, what I want to say is later in later in the chain, later in the in in the process, and I think that that could potentially have an in, uh, impact in terms of local authorities and sort of cash flow, etc. So um, I don't know. Uh, my understanding is that that's actually something which is particularly, I would say, developer friendly rather, rather than local authority planning authority friendly. Yeah, OK. And then just, you know, just briefly on um, forthcoming changes to procurement. Um, and again, I'm not a procurement lawyer, but there is a lot of procurement obviously in the uh, in the regeneration projects that w we advise on. You know, we're not expecting material change in how we advise clients in the future. Um, the, the big picture will pretty much remain the same. Um, public works and public service contracts will still need to be advertised and awarded following a formal competition. Um, and there's no real anticipated changes to case law um, on whether a transaction is a land deal or caught by PCR 2015. And obviously the Faraday decision is the one that everyone's been looking at very closely since since that was published. Um, We'll know more as the bill goes through Parliament, um, but not really until late 2023. Um, and it's very much one for 2023 and, you know, probably justifies its its own session at the time when things are things are a bit clearer. Have you, have you got any other thoughts on that, Rita? Or? I'm just going to say thumbs up. I agree. So uh, the I suppose the only thing I probably would say is is um, is with local authorities and procurement. Um, Sometimes there is a approach as to how can we get round procurement and I think what we and sometimes those conversations take longer than getting through procurement. So I think that there just needs to I, I think that the procurement is a separate session on its own um, and 
it just needs to be really sort of considered in the whole. And what and what I would say is that, as I've said, rather than trying to seek to get round it, let's just get through it. It's normally quite it's it's easier. Yeah, sure. Now we haven't got much um, haven't got much time left, and uh, we were also asked to to touch upon uh, social housing regulation um, and the impacts that's like to have uh, now. Um, the social housing regulation bill um, is is moving on. It obviously results from Grenfell. There's kind of ten key changes. I don't think there's time to go through them all now. Um, there are going to be some difference differences in regulatory standards for local authority RPs compared to private um, registered providers um, in relation to um, you know, current drafting only the economic standard that applies to stock holding authorities the only economic standard will be the rent standard um so those governance and vfm standards only apply to prps because well, local authorities have to deal with that have to comply with similar principles in any event um uh, but that you know there, there, there will be the there will be a need to submit a data return on stock um Broadly, the sense is regulation is going to be more proactive than reactive. I mean, the the principle of co-regulation was already here, wasn't it? Um, tenants need, as as ever, and the ever more need to be listened to um, and and engaged with. Um, there was some talk of an additional standard uh, that measures that sort of tenant satisfaction, um, but as far as I know, that hasn't made it into the bill. Um, What's your what's your thoughts on any of that? Um, again, I I I absolutely agree, and it and it's really important that um, there is solid and good regulation in place. Um, I'm going to start talking about money again. Um, in so far as um, I think that there's a piece about local authorities and central government working together to make conditions better for tenants. We, as I, we sort of talk about what I want to say is um, retro, retrofitting, um, making uh, buildings better, um, uh, and and carrying out the improvements, etc. For me, it's which absolutely there is there's no shirking your responsibility. I just want to be really clear on that. But it's it's another financial pressure um for local authorities Th there is something that i want to touch on which i think is it's slight it's it's slightly related um and that's disrepair cases on the rise for local authorities so um there's many people who who are who are on on this call today will be aware of the high um the media profile and the interest in disrepair cases and there might be quite a few um lawyers on the on this call who are aware of um uh, law law firms etc what i want to call is it's sort of chasing these now to, to be clear if a property is in, in poor condition that that there's just no there's no accepting that and that's that's completely bang out of order as it were but i think that there is a sort of a frustration at the moment with the rise of disrepair cases the availability and the access of local authorities to have access to carry out these works and then these elements of compensation and, and having to meet the costs of legal costs in relation to any sort of claims that are brought so I, I to be honest with you I think that's I think this is a real sort of big issue and I, and I think those two matters work very closely together um, because nobody's saying that you shouldn't be able to make a disrepair claim if, if there is what I want to say is a, a, a serious issue of disrepair, but quite often it's being used as a as a weapon in in certain cases. Um, so I think it's a really good thing. I think it's a really positive thing, as we as I always say, proof is definitely most like going to be in the pudding. Um, but I do think that there is this sort of frustration in relation to this rising disrepair issue. And now, what I, I, as we have this social, um, this this further regulation, and about how we can make the two work work together, and and how yeah. um, how how and each party can understand each party. Yeah, and if we can, can find a way to get that regular and positive engagement, then it becomes less of a kind of them and us, you know, thing, and more of a well, I'll I'll, I'll sort this out and. Uh, and move forward. I mean, just then, I think you know, I think we're probably out of time. But just move. I, th I guess on a sort of round off on a positive note, 
you know, challenges and barriers have been thrown at local authorities, you know, throughout the time that we've been advising them. And it's not, it's it's there and, they, you know, it's, it's, it's been particularly difficult in the last few years, but there's a lot of really good people and uh, clever people and, and, and positive people in local authority. And, and, and I'm sure that they'll rise to the challenge. Melissa? Yeah, and that's probably one thing that I would say is that local authorities, we don't step away from challenges and, and we, we meet our, our, our obligations and, and we do what we have to do and what we want to do as well. And I think that from, from working in house, there's there's so much um, sort of pride in relation to delivering um, for, for your for your communities and, and bringing these schemes forward and actually the positive impact that they, they will make. And um, I guess LERB, what we need to sort of consider with LERB is that it's it's the first, it feels to me that it's it's the first step. Just really briefly, a couple of weeks ago, I posted something on my LinkedIn, um, just a, a post whereby I said, how do how does local government continue to facilitate regener regeneration and, revi and revitalization? And the points that I came up with, establish strong governance, involve communities from the start, develop robust evidence-based visions and investment strategies, repurpose on viable spaces, introduce new homes with new tenures, invest in new physical and digital infrastructure. I think that's going to be really important. Uh, plan for new active modes of travel, restore civic pride and community, uh, create beautiful green spaces, attra um, attractive buildings and open spaces, uh, build on the walkable neighbourhood concept and all of these things are, are part of a regeneration scheme. Do I think LERB solves all of that? I don't think it does, but I think it's a start. And I think that's actually what we need to take away, that as long as there's development and there's momentum and we, we keep pushing things on, everything has to start somewhere. Brilliant. Thank you both. Gosh, you've gone right up to the wall with that and you <laughs> did a brilliant job. Um, of getting through that very, very long list of, of questions. I think we're out of time now. Just a reminder for those who might have joined late, this has been recorded and the video will be circulated in an email um, as soon as it's ready. But that leaves me just to finally say thank you very much uh, to Rita and Lee. That was really brilliant and such great insight. And thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. Thanks, Super. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.